In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thus far, we have traced our Lord's final hours, from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus wrestled with the Father's will, triumphing by persevering in it, until he, though clearly possessing great power, with the mere mention of the name I am, causing the cohort to fall backwards, nevertheless allowed himself to be betrayed and arrested. Then taken first to the high priest's house of Annas, then Caiaphas, the two in collusion with the whole religious leadership, ruled him guilty by the council of the Sanhedrin. Unable to legally execute him, they took him to Pontius Pilate, where our journey continues with the fifth station, Jesus before the Roman governor. Leading him away to Pilate was one of the turning points in the Passion, for it fulfilled the prophecy that our blessed Lord had uttered. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. And straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation of the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people, that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, what will ye then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. When all the gospel accounts are compiled, we know that the Sanhedrin had approached Pontius Pilate with a prisoner charged and found guilty of three charges, misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. But Mark, ever brief, deals with the only charge that mattered to the Romans. This Jesus claims to be a king. He is king of the Jews. Pilate is adamant. Am I a Jew? Meaning, he rejects any association of Israel. We also viscerally cringe with any association of such a persecuted and maligned peoples. Any suggestion that we fall under the rule of the king of the Jews might be met with great protestations. Do I dance the hora? Do I speak Hebrew? Do I long to live in the Holy Land, to become a settler on the west bank of the Jordan? 
When we think this way, we are small-minded people indeed. Jesus was born King of the Jews, yet among his first worshiping subjects were the Gentiles, magi from the East. Many Gentiles would learn to gladly submit to his reign. Jesus held the title and still holds the title King of the Jews or King of Israel. But he soon reveals how the borders of Israel have extended to include every tribe, language, and peoples. The borders of Israel have extended to include even you and I. He is the King of Israel, but of a new Israel, gathering the whole flock from the four corners of the earth. The King of Israel seeks to draw us into the kingdom. The means by which he draws us is the cross. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself, said Jesus. Many of us have trouble associating, identifying as subjects in a kingdom. Even for us Canadians familiar with monarchy, Despite Sir John A.'s desire to identify us as the Kingdom of Canada, the title never gained much traction, so we adopted the term Dominion instead after Psalm 72, verse 8, and finally our current form, just simply Canada. But subjects of a kingdom is what we followers of Jesus are. We are to belong to a body larger than ourselves, it's important to see Jesus as a prophet, speaking truth as he is truth, priest as Jesus is both priest and sacrifice. But he is also our king. He draws us into a kingdom. It's the kingdom of the new Israel, the church. Will we be drawn into such a kingdom or shall we rebel against it? The only sword wielded on behalf of this kingdom is the sword of the Spirit. And the scribes and Pharisees, they did not like that. They wanted a leader like Barabbas, who had a more pragmatic kingdom in mind. Pontius Pilate understood that, that the kingdom of Jesus was not of this world. So Pilate tried to free Jesus three times. He tried to get out of the whole situation by turning him over to Herod. But Jesus came straight back. Pilate's wife had a dream and sent the message, have nothing to do with this innocent man. But the kingdom which would not upset the social order would upset the individual soul. This kingdom of Jesus would demand worship, the love of our neighbor, and suffering, all for the greater good. There would be no glory from such a kingdom, Pilate would wash his hands of him, and so tempted are we. For the only crown worn here below by Jesus, and in turn his followers, is a crown of thorns. The crown is ours, but shall we wear it? Jesus gladly did so. He did so for our salvation, to bring us into the eternal kingdom. For that crown of thorns would be transformed into a beauty beyond compare. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns the few in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. We move on then to the crowning of our King. This is the sixth station. Jesus is scourged at the pillar and crowned with thorns. And the soldiers led him away from the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. And began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! 
And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. The hymnody that is to be read is so appropriate. And on his thorn-crowned head, and on his sinless soul, our sins in all their guilt were laid, that he might make us whole. O perfect life of love, hymn 452, verse 4. So they dressed Jesus up. After his trial by Pilate, Jesus was mocked by the Roman soldiers charged with his death. So far in this story, we have encountered the temple guards who were sent by the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders to arrest Jesus in Gethsemane. But the soldiers mentioned here are different. These are Roman soldiers garrisoned in Jerusalem to support Pilate's occupation of the region. The battalion mentioned in verse 16 could have comprised as many as 600 men, but it probably means those on duty at the time. These soldiers mock Jesus with everyday items. We can imagine one of them pulling the thorn-infested weed from alongside some wall where they stood. They used thorn twigs instead of a crown, a reed instead of a scepter, and a purple robe. The cloak was a military cloak, no doubt on its way to be returned permanently at the quartermasters, being battle-worn and faded from the sun. They would try dyeing it of the blood of Christ, recently flogged from him, letting it flow and congeal into its fibers. The soldiers were young ones at play, perhaps reliving a childhood pastime of playing dress-up with their sisters, but these were truly children of the devil. They dressed Jesus up with everyday items to make believe that he was a king, mocking him. Of course, the underlying irony of all of this is that there could be no better symbols of Jesus' kingship than everyday items. Jesus was incredibly regal. He reigns over heaven and earth. He displayed incredible power throughout his ministry that we might believe in his supremacy. Just hours before, he healed a servant's ear severed by Peter's sword. What healing power did he possess? He is the king of Israel. He is the king of the Jews. But we learn that this title did not limit him to a smallish kingdom, but one to include the world. He was really the king of kings, yet still a servant king, a humble king, an everyday sort of king. The soldiers thought they might be dressing him up, but really they were proclaiming loud and clear who he really was, and really is, and who he shall ever be. He holds all the power of heaven and earth, yet comes in weakness of the everyday things, everyday clothes. Jesus still comes in everyday things. Such are the sacraments. Ordinary water, yet join with the powerful word. Everyday bread, nothing refined. Everyday wine. Wine hadn't taken on status of luxury as it has for us where it's manufactured by specialists and taxed to the hilt, of environmental tax, volume tax, cents on the dollar tax. Instead, wine was a staple of life, the juice squeezed out in the old world way through the tramping of many feet. Lift Jesus clothed in ordinary things and still clothed in ordinary forms of water, bread, and wine, we risk missing him. But the benefit is that we, when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, we are not intimidated by him. For he is the suffering servant king. Let us bow down and worship him. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, 
you released many from their bondage to sin, death, and the devil as the healer of the nations. But when it came time to release you, the crowd chose a murderer instead. Through our co-crucifixion with you in the waters of our baptism, may we continually be released from our sins as we confess you to be our everlasting King. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Amen. Join us next week for Scriptural Stations of the Cross as we continue with Station 7, Jesus Bears His Cross. Number 8, Jesus is Helped by Simon of Cyrene. And Station 9, Jesus Speaks to the Women of Jerusalem. God bless and have a wonderful week.